the Wilson Center. And on behalf of the Latin American Program and also the Kissinger Institute on U.S.-China relations and the China Environment Forum, I'm delighted to welcome you to this morning's session on Chinese companies in Latin America. I'd especially like to recognize my colleagues Robert Daly, the director of the Kissinger Institute, and Jennifer Turner, the director of the China Environment Forum, for collaborating with us in organizing this event. For Latin America and the Caribbean, um, as many of you know, the first decade of the 21st century was deeply marked by the boom of Asian economies, not exclusively that of China, but especially that of China. Trade flows between the Asia-Pacific region and the Latin American and Caribbean region grew by over 20 percent a year between 2000 and 2010, um, and China alone accounted for half of the total trade volume. Just to give a few numbers, I know it's hard to keep this in your head, but, but I think the, the numbers themselves are quite dramatic. Trade with China, trade between Latin America and the Caribbean and China increased from $10 billion in the year 2000 to $257 billion in 2013. That is an increase of close to 2,500 percent. China, as you know, had become the largest export market for Brazil, Chile, and Peru, and the second largest export market for Argentina, Venezuela, Cuba, and Uruguay. Um, the World Bank and others, the Inter-American Development Bank, CEPAL, um, based in Santiago, have noted that the growth in South America, the, the fastest in over three decades, was uh, particularly related to the strength of a country's connections to China. But China, of course, has diverse meanings for the countries of the region. Those countries that export commodities benefited the most from the expansion of trade. The bulk of Latin American exports to China are concentrated in a very small number of commodities. Iron ore from a country such as Brazil, copper from Chile and Peru, crude oil from Venezuela, Brazil, and Colombia, and soy from Brazil and Argentina. But as, as positive as the story was for South American exporters of commodities, competition from cheap manufactured products hurt producers throughout the region, but nowhere more than in Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. This was true vis-a-vis -vis their own domestic markets, um, as well as uh, with respect to their exports. So in contrast to the huge trade surpluses that South American economies um, had with China, um, those, the countries I've just mentioned sustained huge trade deficits. And consider the following. Mexico was China's second largest trade partner in the Latin American Caribbean region after Brazil. But in the year 2013, it had a trade deficit of over $18 billion. Um, those of us who read the news know that last July, Chinese President Xi Jinping traveled to Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela, and Cuba. This was his second trip to the region since he took office in 2013. And he offered tens of billions of dollars in new loans and foreign direct investment from hydroelectric projects to railroads to currency swaps, lines of credit, and port and tourism development. So we know a fair amount, not a, always a lot, given a, a, a certain lack of transparency. We do know, though, a fair amount about the state-to-state -state relationships between China and various Latin American and Caribbean countries. But what about the existing and potential role of Chinese companies, both um, th those that are explicitly the state and those that are um, less uh, state-dominated? Um, other than the heavy investment that we've seen in extractive industries and in construction, what other sectors have attracted the interest of Chinese entrepreneurs? What difficulties or barriers have they faced, um, particularly in the mining sector, where we've seen an explosion of social protest throughout South America in recent years? And has there been a learning process, given those protests, um, with respect to how to operate on the ground? We have an embarrassment of riches um, this morning to address these issues. You have their bio, so I'll introduce them only briefly. Huang Shan 
immediately to my left is the international editor of Kaijing, was the international editor of Kaijing Magazine from 2005 to 2009. He is now the associate managing editor um, and an editorial board member of Kaishin Media. Um, he has a master's degree from the um, University of Notre Dame, uh, where he uh, served on the Notre Dame Greater China Scholarship Selection Committee um, and received his BA in international politics from Peking University in 2001. We're joined also by Yuan Yuanan Zhang, from, uh, who is, um, uh, has joined Keijin's Media's international desk in 2012. She is their Washington correspondent and comes with a long list of credits in her journalistic career, um, interviewing top U.S. officials. Um, and she ha also has extensive experience covering Latin America, visiting, uh, visiting Chile, um, interviewing um, officials from Costa Rica, from Mexico, um, to name a few. She was invited by the State Department in 2013 to be a fellow in the Edward R. Murrow Project for Journalists under the International Visitors um, Leadership Program. And then finally, but not least, Evan Ellis is, um, is almost a household name um, in, in Washington policy circles now for his um, extraordinary um, and, and um, huge output um, of written work and analysis on the relationship between China and Latin America. He is currently a professor of Latin American studies at the U.S. Army War College Str Strategic Studies Institute. Um, he's published over 80 works, including three books, and his latest, um, China on the Ground in Latin America, was just published last month by Paul Grave Macmillan. There are flyers on the table outside the room, so you're encouraged to take a flyer and um, order the book now at a steep discount. Um, <laughs> I'd also like to put in um, a brief plug for a publication that the Wilson Center has just published last week on the relationship between China and, um, and Latin America, but not just China, other countries in Asia, such, such as South Korea, Japan, and India. That uh, book is available um, outside. It will be available online next week, and it is co-edited by Global Fellow Jorge Jaime, who is currently Chile's ambassador to China. So without further ado, turn the floor to Sean. Well, thank you. Thank you, Cindy, for this wonderful introduction. And uh, it's my great honor and it was my call to be here at Wilson Center to uh, make our presentation about, you know, China Inc. footprint in Latin America. And also, this is the first time I, um, I'm being uh, delivered this kind of uh, a presentation in Washington, D.C. So um, thank you all. And so uh, without further ado, I will uh, come to my main thing. So my uh, my main um, topic uh, is about China Inc. learning curve in Latin American countries. So uh, my argument is that I think commercial logics will prevail in the end. Because uh, in previous times, everybody talked about Chinese uh, uh, companies and um, overseas uh, acquisitions and mergers. So it has more to do with the China government's ambitious plan to go out. Everybody knows that uh, China uh, practiced a go out uh, national strategy in 2000. Two and uh, after that, a lot of Chinese companies, mo most of the are state-owned enterprises, and uh, uh, concentrated in the uh, <coughs> uh, construction and infrastructure, and also mining and uh, oil and gas exploration companies. So they are the first batch of uh, Chinese companies that go abroad to uh, uh, people say locking some resources and the energies for for China national economy and uh, China for serve the, the purpose of uh, China's rise. But now we as we have seen that uh, over these years, uh, I think more private companies, especially um, uh, they are not just concentrated on the mining uh, construction, but also uh, they target um, 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 consumer markets and provide uh, um, some tele uh, telecommunications services and uh, foreign services. So we can see uh, a wide variety of uh, industry and uh, um, uh, Chinese companies, they choose to go overseas to acquire and uh, uh, to operate on the ground. So um, um, I will say, um, I will give you an overview of the footprint of the Chinese companies. So I think from the late 1990s and early this century, we have seen because of the job 
geo geopolit uh, geological vicinity and similar development phases. Uh, that makes ASEAN countries, I mean Southeastern Asian countries, uh, the first stops of China Inc. seeking overseas exposure. So um, uh, we have seen that uh, people, Chinese government uh, practice a so-called smiling diplomacy in uh, late 1990s and uh, um, early this century. So a lot of Chinese companies um, um, went to, uh, chose to go to uh, um, Southeastern Asian countries to do a lot of uh, investment and uh, expanding uh, Build and expanding their footprint in these countries. So we know that investments focus on agriculture, forestry, infrastructure, construction, and the resource exploration, but not in the manufacturing basis because everybody knows China is the, the world's biggest factory. So uh, uh, they don't bother go to you know um, um, neighboring countries to to manufacture goods. So. The lessons Chinese company, the first batch of Chinese company, learned from the ASEAN countries separate that uh, we can do something um, um, uh, not just in the neighboring countries, but also we can have more further safari. So next we can we have seen the all the focus on the Africa. So I think the, the important year is the 2006 is a milestone year for Chinese companies go the, the, the big wave of uh, go overseas of uh, Chinese companies. So, uh, the, the backdrop is the China's African policy launch in this year, and also the China-Africa summit took place in Beijing in um, 2006. And uh, against this, uh, this backdrop, we have seen that uh, um, um, you know, a lot of Chinese companies, especially the uh, state-owned mining and the construction companies, they began their um, Africa safari. And uh, um, as as far as we know, that uh, um, they create a lot of um, as many as uh, as many controversies as bright spots they had achieved. So everybody knows if you read uh, the um, international um, newspaper coverage about trans companies footprint in Africa. So I think it's very very com you know complicated stories. So a lot of people said trans uh, companies, their proxy of trans government, is actually locking resources, and uh, um, this is for the sort of the purpose of a China rise. So I think um, um, it's kind of a setback for Chinese quite ambition, you know, um, go overseas plan. But uh, I think this is uh, the hardest lesson uh, Trans Inc. China Inc. learned in the um, um, Afri African safari. And uh, now we have seen that uh, um, with the um, 2008, China uh, hosts the Beijing Olympic Games, and the 2000, you know, uh, financial crisis ravaged the, f uh, the Western world. So China, from then, China was becoming more confident, and sometimes you can say it's somewhat ar arrogant on the world stage. So we have seen the smiling diplomacy has sort of disappeared, and China become more assertive on international stage. So just you know, over. This thing you can see the situation in Hong Kong. So everybody knows that the trans government is feeling more confident um, to claim to uh, to claim its its um, its requirement. To um, uh, we are not shy to send our um, project our you know hard power and soft power on the world stage. So I think China now is becoming more assertive, more confident player on the world stage. So the question is that um, whether China will play by the book. Uh, you know, written by the Western world. So I think this is a big question. This is a question you can trace back to the, the early this century. That China to rise, whether China to rise is peaceful. I think maybe some of the uh, uh, you know people and academics and policymakers in Western capitals would say we now have a conclusion: China to rise is not peaceful. China's um, rise will come at the expense at the expense of the uh, the current world you know, current world order. So this is one argument. But I would say just put aside the political side. Let's look at uh, the commercial um, activities of Chinese companies. Because I think now um, the biggest difference between China, China Inc. African footprint and the layers in Latin, um, Latin American country lies in the fact that the commercial interests other than political motivations begins to prevail. So um, you can see, uh, if you look at the landscape in uh, Chinese companies for print in Latin American companies, yes, I, ag I would uh, agree that uh, most of the uh, operations still concentrated on the mining and the construction company. But we also noticed that a lot of Chinese companies, uh, for example, private company, we know uh, they're trying to acquire uh, fruit 
uh, production facilities and agriculture um, um, field, trying to uh, feed you know increasing demand from China's the uh, increasing uh, middle class people. I think this represents a very good opportunity for you know to for Chinese companies to practice to operate another kind of uh, uh, activities in 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 Latin American countries because the uh, uh, you know the the wide variety of climates and the geographies in Latin American countries. So it provides a very rich um, field for Chinese company to explore local expertise and human resources and uh, to um, provide uh, uh, <coughs> high quality agricultural products to Chinese um, increasing um, um, middle class people. So I think uh, the, the case in point is the uh, Joy Royal um, company is the um, uh, private company affiliated Lenovo Group. So they acquire a lot of assets in Chile. So when I talk with the uh, uh, their head of uh, local operations, they they are they were quite proud to be uh, proud to tell me that uh, they just hire a uh, local head to run you know daily ba daily uh, uh, operation instead of uh, have Chinese face. Uh, on, on the ground. I think this represents a kind of a break from the uh, an old fashioned approach by Chinese company. So we import local uh, Chinese labor force, we import um, China, um, um, Chinese workmen to, um, to operate business locally. So I think, um, yes, maybe just the uh, slight change, but uh, anyway, it's a rapid kind of uh, um, rethinking of the, uh, the way of doing business here. So I would argue that uh, business as, as usual may not be working now. So maybe we should uh, uh, have a new thinking about uh, how the Chinese inks they adjusting adjust themselves to local environment and uh, the learning curve they are sp speed up their learning curve and trying to um, adapt to local environment. So um, before I I get in this hall, so Evan asked me uh, what's the biggest challenge for trans company here. So I would still argue that uh, um, in our, because we will in find over, over time, we'll find that we involve some legal battle and we will some, we violate some um, 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 environmental standards here. But the key issue is that we don't shy away from these problems. We just the, uh, trying to um, um, confront these problems has on. That means the, uh, we can hire local law firm and uh, we can have our lobby activities here. So we just the, uh, practice the, uh, what has been uh, practiced by our Western peers here. So I I think this is the learning that we have stepped out a learning curve. So I think um, we need to uh, adopt a new angle or new perspective to look at how Chinese company doing their business here. And um, well, I will stop here and uh, um, I'll turn the floor to my colleague and uh, she will uh, talk about Chinese, Chinese companies uh, and also Chinese government um, um, or activities in Latin American countries from a, a bigger perspective. Thanks. Please. Okay. okay. <clears throat> First, I would like to um, thank the Wilson Center for having me here. Um, as a correspondent, I actually had um, quite extensive experience to be an audience in this building. So it's really my honor to be sitting here today. Um, I agree with Huang Shan that Chinese company um, has a strong ability to adapt to the local rules. Um, for example, um, in the past, Chinese companies are used to bring a lot of labor force into foreign countries when they invest in the um, infrastructure projects. But when I visited Chile last year, I was um, waiting at the airport in Paris. Um, there are not many Chinese people left um, to transfer to San Diego. There were two guys sitting next to me, and they look like um, villagers, so I talked with them. They're actually um, construction workers for a Chinese um, company. And I asked him, um, do you speak Spanish? And he said, no, not even a word. Um, and then I asked, um, is there a huge Chinese team um, in your company? And he said, no, because Chile has a requirement um, that you can only have um, a maximum 15% of Chinese um, labor force that you can bring to the country. He's not um, in the management um, level. He's just a construction worker, but he knows the rules very clearly. So I think um, when Chinese companies are going abroad, um, when they went to 
when they go to a company, uh, go to a country that has a stronger governance capacity, um, has clear rules, they have the ability to adapt. Um, from the two last trips of our President Xi, I think um, China has caught a lot of, a lot of attention that um, China and the region has a very close economic ties. I think you, you are probably familiar with the number that China's loan um, of two, in 2010 is 37 billion US dollars, and that's more than um, those of World Bank and Inter American Development Bank and US Export, in Export Import Bank combined. Um, but I think the relationship is expanding into other territories, for example, the political exchange and, uh, and also cultural exchange. And one of the signal is in um, July this year, China CELAC Forum is established, and China has already um, had a few similar mechanisms for the political exchange with other regions, for example, the ASEAN China Summit, the China Arab States Cooperation Forum, and also um, Forum on China African Cooperation. And those um, has expanded China's relationship um, into a broader um, area, including, of course, including the trade and economic, but um, has a platform for the political leaders to exchange their views. Um, when, when we are um, talking about Latin America and Chinese companies' um, investment, we often compare um, with China's um, practices in Africa because it's often criticized. But I think there are um, several differences. For one, um, China and Latin America has a similar development phase. Um, and also, I think China can actually learn from the past um, experiences from Latin America. From what I heard is um, Chinese, there is a um, delegation of Chinese officials from um, the financial institution in China uh, went to Chile to learn how to manage the bankruptcy of state-owned companies because they have the past experiences and not to collapse the economy. So I think um, in terms of avoiding the um, mid-income trap, China actually can learn from Latin America, and that's quite different from Africa. And the second is um, the um, Latin America is more stable and um, more have more um, institutions um, in this region. Um, that's pretty much the same as I said before, um, because it has a more mature um, investment system in some countries like Chile, like Costa Rica. Um, so it's, it's an experiment field for Chinese companies to practice their um, um, doings in terms of going abroad. And the third one is um, they have a, Latin America generally have a um, stronger legal system and higher education level than Africa. Um, but in terms of the um, China CELAC Forum, I think what I expect is um, Latin America will seek um, more role in the agenda setting and planning on the cooperation, um, which is different from the dominant role um, of China in other mechanisms that I talked before. Um, so generally, when we, when we look at, for example, the President Xi's visit, we saw a lot of numbers like millions of do, um, billions of dollars investment, um, and also pictures of him um, tasting Costa Rican coffee, um, the trade and economic ties. But just as the U.S. Um, State Department um, State Secretary, Secretary of State John Kerry, um, repeatedly said that um, economic policy is foreign policy and foreign policy is economic policy. So I think when we look at China's relationship with Latin America, we need to look at a bigger picture of China's um, foreign policy strategy. And so far, um, of course, China is still um, paying a lot of attention with the um, major countries like Russia and also um, US. But um, also we can see there is increasing um, focus on the emerging countries. Um, so far, um, Xi Jinping, uh, President Xi has visited all the BRICS countries, 
um, and the most recent one is um, India. Um, and also, um, he visited Latin America regions twice, as uh, Mr. Huang mentioned. I think that um, that is also has something to do with China's domestic situation, because um, one of the major um, mission of President Xi is to push the structural reform in China while um, maintaining the economic growth. So while he's um, trying to um, push the Chinese economy um, and also the Chinese companies move up the value chain, and he also has like the anti-corruption campaigns, and also now we see the correction in the property market. He needs the, um, we can't, he, the China can't lose the steam, the, the, the steam of the economic growth. So we are trying to look for new markets to do the export, to do the trade, and to do the investment. Um, China, uh, China has a lot of, um, I would say, excess construction capacities, and also the um, experience that we can export. So that's why we see when the Prime um, Minister Li Keqiang and also the President, when they went abroad to do their trips, no matter it's in um, Africa or in Southeast Asia, they're trying to sell um, like high-speed bullet trains and also our um, infrastructure um, capacities. Um, l the most recent one is China offers to invest 300 billion in India's infrastructure. Um, I think um, in most of the emerging markets, that would be a win-win situation because like um, India, Brazil, they all have the need and demand to expand their infrastructure in order, to, um, in, in order for, their grow for their economy to grow. Um, and we can see that at Latin America has a trend to pivot to Asia as well. Um, some of the countries joined the TPP negotiations, and also four countries um, has established the um, Pacific Alliance, and Costa Rica is trying to join as the fifth country. Um, and I think the Pacific Alliance has a, a quite clear um, ambition to extend the trade relations with China. When I was in Beijing, I went to their events and talked with um, the officials from those countries. Um, and when Mr. Huang was there, he went to a forum um, held by four of the pa um, Pacific Alliance countries. Um, and I think the other thing is um, Latin America is, the relationship with Latin America is one of the um, important part of China's South-South cooperation. Um, and you can say that um, I, I don't think China is challenging the Western um, system, but um, just like many other emerging countries, they are trying to seek an alternative um, to the current system. For example, the BRICS New Development Bank and um, CRA, and also the um, Asian infrastructure, infrastructure Investment Bank. So in the South and South cooperation, um, one thing that appreciated by um, many countries is that they they might have the equality between the member countries. For example, the Bri um, BRICS New Development Bank, they're trying to um, allocate the positions among the member countries, like the president would be from India, like the governor's chair would be um, from Russia and Brazil, and the headquarters will be in Shanghai. So in generally, I think um, when we look at the, the relationship with um, Latin America, one is to look at the domestic um, situation in China, and the other one is China's role, um, growing role in the world stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Cynthia. Thank you very much uh, also to the panelists. Uh, first of all, let me just say uh, I also am, am just honored to be here. Uh, the, as many of you who are regulars here at the Wilson Center know, uh, this is just an excellent program. It's uh, difficult to think a senior leader uh, from Latin America comes to uh, to visit Washington, D.C., and uh, one does not find him on the agenda at some point uh, with uh, Dr. Arnson in, in the Wilson Center. So uh, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to, to be here. Um, I think uh, you probably all share with me uh, my uh, assessment, really, that uh, we have uh, two very well-informed, wonderful panelists, and I couldn't help but think that uh, if uh, we had the, the level of, of awareness and, and, and candor um, from, uh, um, from uh, uh, in, in 
across the board in, in U.S.-China relations, uh, things uh, would be, uh, would be uh, even, even more uh, positive than they are currently. I also want to say uh, that uh, um, my current position, I'm a uh, professor, as was mentioned, with the U.S. Army War College Strategic Studies Institute. Um, and so as such, I have to uh, have the explicit disclaimer that uh, nothing of what I'm about to say today in any way represents the, the U.S. government or, or my institution. Having said that, um, let me uh, just uh, proceed to forward uh, with a, a couple of uh, different comments. First of all, with respect to the speakers themselves, um, I, I think uh, each of the speakers made some, some very important points I, I want to highlight. Um, one, I am absolutely in agreement with uh, what was said by, by, by Mr. Wong with respect to the importance of understanding this learning curve and the ability to adapt of Chinese companies, which as much as the horror stories that we hear or the difficulties of Chinese companies, um, we have to keep in mind that continuous process of adaptation and, and learning. Um, another uh, fundamental point I think that uh, Mr. Wang posed was this question, as China engages in Latin America, perhaps uh, it's not, uh, you know, is China's rise peaceful or no, but the fundamental question, and one also posed by distinguished uh, uh, other Chinese uh, scholar, Liang Xinjiang, um, is will China play by the Western book? Um, and I think uh, the answer to the question, will it play by the Western book versus is China's rise peaceful, are subtly different in important ways. Um, with respect to uh, Ms. Zhang's comments, uh, also uh, very, very astute, very, very uh, good um, series of comments and analysis, um, I think one of the very important points uh, that she made is um, to recognize that um, China's behavior in different countries in Latin America is shaped by the context of those countries themselves. The strength of the legal system, the ability to uh, get around laws with respect to um, particularistic political relationships, um, and, and indeed, uh, as, as we've seen uh, in Chile, uh, the behavior of Chinese companies in Chile is perhaps very different than the behavior of Chinese companies in Venezuela and in other places, that uh, Latin Americans agency itself shapes how um, China and Chinese companies uh, behave. I think another important point that she made was with respect to um, this notion of the, the political, um, that in some ways, uh, um, although uh, there is a muddy line between what is economic and political, I think, as she pointed out very well, uh, citing our, our Secretary uh, Kerry. Um, but uh, as we've seen through such things as the uh, um, President Xi's, uh, both of his trips, uh, the first to uh, 11 different bilateral uh, um, uh, interactions uh, all north of, uh, of, of Panama in, in June 2013, and most recently the, uh, the series of activities, uh, you know, Argentina, ALBA, and, uh, and, and uh, Brazil with, with the BRICS uh, summit, and, and the china Slack engagement, um, in many ways, um, while it's difficult to say whether that means it's becoming increasingly political or politicized, it is clearly becoming um, more willing to touch on areas of, of U.S. discomfort. I wanted to uh, briefly make um, really, really five points uh, of my own with respect to um, what we've seen on China's engagement in, in Latin America. And uh, thank you very much also, Dr. Aronson, for uh, your, your uh, gracious plug for, for my book. Um, it's uh, China on the Ground in, in Latin America, just released a, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> But um, the, first, the first theme that I want to point out is that um, in Latin America, uh, there are multiple different dynamics and multiple different sectors. We can talk about the extractive industries, agriculture, construction, manufacturing, service industries, and other uh, technology niche areas. Um, but really, the dynamics of each sector in each country is different, um, as was already pointed out. We find that there are different roles of local partners. Uh, for example, if we look in manufacturing, uh, for example, partnerships in auto manufacturing with companies like Sanascar in, in Ecuador and in Colombia um, versus a very different role of, of local partners if we look at the manufacturing sector. Different mixtures of the role of state-owned enterprises versus locally backed Chinese uh, champions, such as, for example, Cherry representing Anhui province, versus private investors um, of all sizes, from the smallest in, um, business groups to mega private investors such as such as Sani, the, the Chinese construction firms. Different modes of entry, um, whether entering projects via state-to-state -state relationships, uh, competitive procurements, as, as uh, was pointed out in Chile, or um, by uh, the success of growth, as we've seen Huawei and ZTE uh, successively expand their presence from the ground up um, in uh, much of Latin America in the telecom sector. And also different models of ownership. Um, in some cases, um, mergers and acquisitions. In some cases, we've seen actually minority holdings which allow Chinese companies to essentially acquire a seat at the table and learn without taking the political 
um, responsibility and putting themselves in the political limelight. We've seen this uh, in, in a number of important uh, engagements, uh, the acquisition of a uh, minority stake in CBMM, Perenco, Plus Petrol, as well as some of the ones that don't even make the books uh, where uh, China Investment Corporation um, uses its massive resources to invest in you know, two or three percent stakes in, in a number of country, companies. The second point I wanted to make is that there is a reciprocal relationship between the promotion of um, that business activities are used politically and politics is used by business interests. In the sense, we see that um, China's massive ability to provide funding for Latin America, we find very much that uh, the theme of President Xi's recent trip, for good or for worse, was essentially, um, you know, China is putting its cash on the table. Um, we, uh, you know, want you to sign up to these projects. The, you know, total of $35 billion in funds set up during, during Brazil, um, the um, over 400 different agreements that have been signed over the years with, with Venezuela, over $55 billion in loans paid out there, et cetera, um, essentially not only creating opportunities for Chinese businesses, but creating um, sustaining engagement in politically important uh, sectors and countries, um, certainly the ALBA countries and certainly the strategic proximity of the Caribbean countries to, to the United States. But reciprocally, um, the use of China's political interests um, by, um, by Chinese businessmen. It was often said that the former head of China Development Bank, Chen Yuan, um, saw an opportunity in what was essentially a policy bank to build a massive empire through loaning the you know, 40 plus billion dollars then that he loaned to Venezuela and, and elsewhere in the region. So in fairness, one can say it works both ways. Um, but clearly, we have to recognize that there's not always an alignment between the activities of different Chinese bureaucratic organizations, just as there's not always an alignment between state, DOD, and, and other organizations here. Um, we can clearly see different interests, for example, a Ministry of Foreign Commerce versus a Ministry of Foreign Affairs in dealing with the behavior of Chinese companies such as Shogang in Peru, uh, differences in perspective between Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Defense in doing things like promoting uh, arms sales by Chinese companies such as Norenko, Polytechnologies, e et cetera. Um, point number three, China th faces challenges in the region that are similar to those faced by other foreign multinationals, but these are exaggerated by differences in the language and cultural understanding, and that may lead to a poor handling of the situation. In other words, there's nothing magic about China entering the region. The problems are not that different, but you find issues where it could have been handled better by a company with more local knowledge, although the Chinese are getting better. We find uh, it, um, difficulties in selection of local partners, um, a, a difficulty that they had, uh, that Sino Hydro had in, for example, pursuing a project called Hidro Tuango in Colombia, um, or indeed the case of uh, Punta Perla in the Dominican Republic, where essentially a, a Spanish investor ran off with the money of all the Chinese investors and is now wanted by Interpol. Um, you find uh, difficulties with uh, um, th these things happen. Uh, China is, you know, a victim as much as a protagonist in, in America, uh, in, in Latin America. Um, cultural policies that don't always play well, um, things having to do with long work hours, things that have to do with, uh, for example, um, the Chinese uh, attitude uh, dealing locally in China itself, uh, how you uh, give compensation to locals when you expropriate their property. Um, that expropriation model has not always played well in Latin America, and so you find places like in the Petucha 3 uh, project in, in, um, in Honduras or the, um, um, the in, in, in Choni, uh, where the, the locals are uh, dissatisfied with the level and arrangements for compensation that they've gotten decide to either take to the streets or actually protest in, in violent ways. Um, the language barriers that, all, that not only hurts at the higher levels, but oftentimes um, creates problems with the projects at the lower levels when those Chinese workers, as, as was pointed out, uh, who speak no Spanish, are seen as essentially the other. Um, not only the other because the local workers are, are not being employed and they see the Chinese workers there behind the fences of the work sites, but the other in the sense that um, by contrast to um, workers from certain other countries where the language barrier is easier to cross, um, there is the loss of the opportunity many times at the lowest levels for Chinese to engage in friendships and generate goodwill with the locals, um, and uh, although that's something that uh, also there's progress being made. Um, number four, obstacles to market entry. Um, 
and operational challenges are across virtually all the sectors. Um, market entry, we find difficulties, resistance to mergers and acquisitions. Companies like the Chinese company, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, the Canadian uh, minerals company, Naranda, um, sometimes um, mergers and acquisitions fail from within, such as the massive failure of the uh, the Pan American Energy uh, deal a couple of years ago. Um, sometimes there's difficulties in winning bids. Uh, we talked a little bit about the, the Chilean model. Um, sometimes there are pushback by competitors and affected parties in allowing Chinese companies to win approvals. Um, a few examples, uh, the case of Dragon Mart now in, in Mexico, uh, the case of the Mirador Mine by, by the Chinese uh, minerals company Tongling, uh, Toramocho, um, by the Huang in the agricultural sector, et cetera. But there are also operational challenges, challenges with the labor force. Um, oftentimes, uh, again, you know, when Chinese companies become local investors, they have to deal with local labor, and often the cultural model of Chinese management does not work well. But sometimes there's frankly difficulties and expectations, um, oftentimes stealing, uh, stemming from um, Although Chinese companies are becoming better in employing more local labor, as, as my colleague pointed out, uh, sometimes the expectations outpace what can actually be achieved. And so you have cases, for example, the violence in Peru, I'm sorry, in, in Ecuador in the 2007 with Petro Oriental, um, the difficulties even earlier with, with Shogang, where there's the expectation that the Chinese companies will come in and, and employ hundreds or thousands and then employ very few, um, creating a lot of local resentment. Environmental pushback, um, not just in well-known cases in Peru, such as Toromocho, um, but also across the board in places such as Ecuador. I mentioned before the, the, the case of, of, uh, um, uh, of Tongling in Zaboro Chinchipe, um, but also even in places like Mexico, lesser-known cases, for example, uh, in, in a mine near Puebla, where a, 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 a Chinese mining company, JDC Minerals, uh, came in. Um, the locals were so frustrated with the environmental situation that they, that they literally took over the mine and, and ran the poor Chinese engineers um, out of the mine and, uh, and, and told the authorities had, had to come. And so uh, the point is that uh, you see these obstacles, and importantly, it's not to say that the obstacles indicate that Chinese companies are bad, but in many ways, this Chinese presence is becoming part of the political dynamic and is becoming part of the social dynamic of contemporary Latin America. And my final point, um, and I think already my, uh, my, my colleagues uh, captured some of this, the Chinese companies are learning and they're getting better even while conflict is increasing. So there's an interesting dynamic that I believe will play out differently in each country, just in the same way that uh, the U.S. is not universally loved and respected in all countries in Latin America, but some better than others. And I think the same will be the case for the Chinese. So you find uh, that uh, in some places uh, the use of local consultants, the use of, of more local face. Chinalco has done a fairly good deal with the hiring of social capital um, in, in Peru. There's another interesting in case Na Jing Zhao um, in a mine called Pampa de Pongo, where um, they've displayed greater sensitivity to, to local concerns. Um, in Guyana, an interesting case of, of the meeting with uh, the uh, local uh, Afro-Guyanese opposition uh, leader, David Granger, um, where in many ways, uh, in, in illustration, the Chinese are learning not only how to deal at the corporate level, but learning how to deal at the political level of not putting all of their eggs in the basket of dealing just with the leading party, but, uh, but, but others. Um, in the end, there's another interesting dynamic that's occurring as, as well, um, and this goes to the question of what happens as Chinese growth slows. Um, and while uh, Chinese growth is still pretty good, I think we're at 7.5 percent, the forecast for, for, for the coming year, and if you compare that to a, a uh, country such, such as Brazil, there's a clear imbalance between the, the different uh, letters in, in the BRICS these days. Um, but uh, it's something that uh, Latin Americans, especially in the extractive sectors, are mindful of. And the question becomes that as Chinese domestic growth weakens, as my colleague alluded to, you'll see contradictory things happening at the same time. One is that you see an accelerated push by Chinese companies into foreign markets, looking for more foreign sources of capital as domestic projects dry up, looking for more foreign construction projects. And so, ironically, on the one hand, we can actually expect to see more Chinese foreign engagement as the Chinese economy weakens. And yet at the same time, you have um, a decreased perception in Latin America of the benefit of selling products to China, et cetera. And so um, I would argue that this creates a challenge for the Chinese because the Chinese presence will be ever more felt in Latin America, even at the same time that the expectations, that wave of expectations that was really generated in about 2008 when China helped to rescue much of South America from the, uh, the economic crisis, um, that's dissipating a bit, dissipating at a time in which arguably Chinese companies and the Chinese government uh, need it most. And 
I want to just close with an interesting comment. As you're aware, uh, the uh, India's Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, uh, is, is uh, been here in, in Washington uh, this week. And thinking about uh, the use of the Chinese phrase, win-win relationship, talking about Latin America or, or, or the United States. Um, Prime Minister Modi, in talking about the United States, um, said that, had a statement that really struck me. He said, we, meaning India and the United States, have a stake in each other's success. And to me, that is the type of tone, not only that is very encouraging for the Indo-US relationship, but the type of tone I think that we need to find with the, the, the Sino-US relationship in, in Latin America, not just the win-win, but the sense of, of we truly have a stake, and, and really all the way around with the region as well, um, in all of our successes. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. These are perfect. All terrific presentations. Thank you to uh, all three of you. I'm going to start by just putting a couple of questions on the table, which you can either address now or come back to, and then we'll open it up um, to the floor. Question number one. Um, could you explain with a little bit more precision the difference between a state-owned Chinese company and a private and something that might be a hybrid or something in between? Because I think there's a lot of confusion in Latin America about what that represents. Um, second, given that we are uh, co-sponsoring this event with the China Environment Forum, I was wondering if you could be specific about a learning process in the mining industry, in the extractive sector in particular, because I remember w at the very beginning when Chinese investment in mining in a country such as Peru um, began, Chinese investments were seen as the dirtiest, as the most um, um, in violation of labor rights and, and, and most other kinds of standards. So in, if you could offer a concrete example of how in, in, in that sector, which has been the scene of so much conflict in the region, um, things have gotten better. And then finally, as a way of sort of perhaps getting more concrete about the first question, if anyone has a comment about the current um, efforts to build a canal through Nicaragua, um, where there are tens of billions of dollars in, uh, in, in an investment presumably by a private Chinese company, um, a project that has raised many eyebrows but is nonetheless um, beginning to break ground. So I wanted to put those three um, on the table uh, and perhaps you know, take a first round of questions if anybody wants to um, jump in. Um, anyone want to start? Juan? Maybe I can talk about a little bit about the canal issue. So um, um, actually, we traced this story uh, for more than two years. And everybody trying to look into the background of the guy, um, Mr. Wan. And people say he has kind of a close connection to a leadership, uh, top leadership. And he's kind of one of the princelings. But we found out that uh, he has nothing to do with the actual princeling group. But anyway, I think you can see still see the uh, um, for example, the uh, China Development Bank's uh, Development Bank um, are behind um, his behavior. So there's no doubt about this. Um, so I don't think it's a uh, uh, it's a behavior um, that can you know of such large scale. Um, this behavior can be conducted by a single private company. Uh, it's, there's no way for this. So um, I would argue that uh, um, it's 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 a kind of ambition by the Chinese government, uh, not Chinese government by by um, one single trans um, businessman, and he get kind of a tacit support from China Development Bank to build and expand China's presence, particularly in the, in the area of uh, infrastructure and construction. But a key interesting issue is, is that uh, um, um, you know um, this country, uh, Nicaragua. Is, has no diplomatic relationship with China, and it's a kind of a political barrier for any China company, Chinese company, <coughs> to operate on the ground. But the other interesting issue is that we have you know, the Panama Canal, and it's operated by the uh, uh, um, Li Keqing's, um, um, you know, uh, companies operated on by Li Keqing. Um, so. Uh, I think here you may see some commercial interest in this kind of grand scale project. But anyway, I think we cannot ignore the political sentiment, uh, uh, political um, um, elements in this in this you know big big project. 
And to talk about the uh, difference between the SOE and the private company, I would argue that uh, um, SOE companies mostly focus on the operation in mining, construction, infrastructure, because this is a very time-consuming and fund-consuming uh, uh, business. I don't think any single Chinese company can uh, do this operation um, on their own. But uh, we, uh, we're talking about a lot of uh, increasing number of trans private companies. They trying to uh, um, explore market, for example, in agriculture sectors. So you, you have seen um, um, more and more trans companies, and they trying to uh, move into a consumer markets and trying to acquire premium and high quality. Um, f plantations and the fields to grow um, 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 uh, agricultural product to, to just for purpose of the feed Chinese increasing number of middle class people. So, um, uh, so yeah, I, I, I think um, SOE is the only dominant force in Latin American countries, but uh, the force of uh, private sectors is increasing, and uh, they are trying to uh, diversify Chinese the, uh, investment portfolio here. And I think this is a gesture welcomed by China's strat Chinese strategy. And uh, just look at uh, um, another side, or maybe um, a little bit straight away from uh, seeing this question. So I would argue that one of the learning lessons or learning um, curve um, um, learned of, uh, by Chinese side is that uh, Talking about the, um, um, what I know is that uh, trans leadership now they are trying to uh, learn some lessons from the uh, um, transition, political system transition. What I know is that uh, they're trying to learn something for, from, from the Spanish peaceful transition from the Franco dictatorship to the uh, constitutional monarchy. You know, today um, a solid uh, base in, 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 in in Spain, and also people talking about the, for example, from the, the year of 1971 to 1990s under the dictatorship Pinochet in Chile. So it's a representative another case in point for Chinese leadership to consider <coughs> how to uh, manage um, the, the kind of uh, political system transition. Everybody, everybody knows that uh, um, now ev you know, the root causes for a lot of uh, Chinese domestic problems. But I think now um, the leadership uh, is, we, we see the anti-corruption <coughs> campaign, we have seen the uh, try to streamline the economic uh, decision-making process. A lot of uh, work uh, are on, on underway. But, the, the, but now all these the, um, um, measures and steps just deal with the uh, surface problems instead of the uh, root cause of the problem. So I think they are, uh, they are learning some lessons from this peaceful transition of the, the, the political system. So I think this is the why uh, my colleague um, um, Yuan mentioned that uh, we send the uh, um, high-level uh, financial services uh, delegation to Chile and to other countries learn how to um, uh, manage um, the, um, um, you know, for example, banking corruption, uh, uh, banking bankruptcy, and uh, things like that. So because we are uh, uh, at uh, the same um, um, development phases, and uh, um, it's easier and uh, convenient for us, or uh, workable for us to learn lessons from our peers instead of the, uh, you know, our uh, peers in advanced economy, because there are less the um, um, ground in common for 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 China companies and uh, you know with the uh, companies in American and uh, European countries. So I think if you combine this within the big context of the Chinese um, Chinese government, uh, the way of uh, seeking um, to have a peaceful transition to a more stable uh, system. So they're trying to learn the dif uh, the different lessons from the different countries. I think the, the case in point is in the uh, Latin America and in emerging economies. Um, I could follow up a little bit on the second question, the learning process in mining. Um, I talked with a, um, a manager um, of a state-owned mining company. Um, and he told me that it's actually not difficult to find out the old ways of doing business in Latin America or in other countries wouldn't work. For example, invite an official for a dinner or like coffee or give gifts just doesn't work because it has a transparent system um, in some of the countries. So um, he's very proud and say that um, after we arrive here, 
um, since he arrived in this office, he's never invited a single official for dinner or give any um, gifts. And um, that's not something that they have to be in Latin America to learn. When I was in Beijing, I talked with um, a Latin American embassy, I wouldn't name which one, um, and he said that um, one Chinese military um, officer, because um, there are some sales between the two countries, like the uniforms and stuff like that, and he asked um, if the embassy could connect him with um, the officials or the ministers um, in that country to you know, push this sale, and the embassy just told, we don't do that. So it's not very difficult for the Chinese companies to learn that these kind of ways of doing business just doesn't work. Um, and the second one is, I think, um, because in those um, countries, there are other competitors, like, the, mm, for example, US entered, um, or European com companies have entered into this area very early. So for Chinese companies, they know they have to, um, for example, invest more in talents. Um, that Chinese um, company manager told me that half, oh, um, over half of my staff um, have PhD degree, and we also have a legal team to maintain our um, legal rights because we need to com compete with those countries. So I think they also learn from the other countries um, of doing business in, in the region. Um, and also the third one is um, in the mining industry, this, even the state-owned companies has um, learned and has been trying to reduce the reliance on um, the financing from the state-owned or the policy um, banks. Because um, that, that manager told me that um, even their performance is good, but certain grants were stopped because there's um, serious disagreement in the policy bank because some of the um, people in there are more conservative about invest in um, risky projects um, overseas, especially when um, the domestic situation, the economic situation is not very good. So they have um, divers diversified for their finance either from the local banks or they're trying to provide services to um, other Chinese companies or the international companies to do some projects to earn some more money. Thanks. In, in, um, with respect to my case, uh, let me uh, start out uh, by talking a little bit about the environmental uh, issue. Um, first of all, to put a plug in for a, a very good uh, uh, study that was uh, done by a colleague of mine, uh, Kevin Gallagher, and, and one of his grad students, uh, Amos Irwin. Um, it was an interesting study uh, taking a look at the mining sector in Peru. Um, and. What they concluded was that while the performance of, of Chinese uh, mining companies in Peru is not spectacular, um, it is not necessarily that much out of line with the performance of, of other non-Chinese mining companies. Um, in addition, um, taking a look at uh, Chinese banks, one even the Chinese policy banks like China Development Bank, one does find um, evidence that there are technically requirements for environmental impact studies, et cetera, although it's not always uh, clear whether those studies are actually done or to what degree uh, they actually are done. Um, there are a couple areas, though, we have to be very careful what we mean when we talk about environmental impact. Um, one of the things is inherently the nature of Chinese engagement in Latin America is environmentally more impactful than in some than the profiles of, of some other uh, countries which invest in different areas. Because where Chinese investment is most concentrated is in the petroleum sector, in the mining sector, in agriculture, in um, big construction projects like hydroelectric projects, which inherently displace large numbers of people from, from, from terrain. And so inherently, um, there's a footprint because of the nature of, of where Chinese companies are, are going. Now, having said this, in general, one finds that Chinese companies are getting better not just with environmental compliance per se, um, but with essentially dealing with environmental um, and, and other issues. And so, again, probably one of the, the best uh, cases was uh, the case of, of China Aluminum Corporation, Chinalco, in the case of the Toromocho mine, one of, actually not the mine, but uh, just this, this mountain of, of copper. Um, and uh, um, unfortunately, on top of the mountain of copper, there was a small community called Morococho of about 5,000 people. And so literally, they had to move the community. Um, they did something very smart. They hired uh, some of the, the best um, 
best environmentally compliant managers in the industry, local Peruvian managers. They, they hired also a local consulting firm called Social Capital. Um, they did a pretty good job of um, basically attending to the needs of the locals, uh, um, uh, moving, convincing 5,000 people to basically relocate to a, a different community a little bit uh, farther down the hill from the mine wasn't perfect, but considered in general an industry standard. Um, similar case, a newer investment by Najing Zhao in, in Pampo de Pongo, uh, just getting started now, but uh, some interactions with the locals, it turned out that the mining port that they were going to build um, would have had a significant impact on, on local fishing practices, so they decided to um, to, to move that port about, about 10 miles a, a away. Um, there are a series of cases like this, and again, it doesn't indicate that Chinese firms are becoming more or less environmentally compliant. I mean, there are the well-publicized stories of of, of, of Shogang and the dumping of industrial tailings uh, in, into the, um, you know, in basically into the rivers that ran out to the ocean uh, from 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 the early 1990s. But it seems clear that Chinese are getting a better feeling that environmental issues can have an operational impact and they need to address these things. With respect to the canal, um, it, it, it's interesting that uh, with respect to Wang Jing, um, first of all, little by little, um, Things are coming out of Edo's past. I mean, clearly that uh, he, he made his he made his fortune in the mining sector um, in uh, places like Cambodia and Thailand. And, and for those of you know who China, um, uh, you know, uh, you know the Chinese executives who make their fortunes in Cambodia and, and Thailand, uh, it, it starts out, starts you out worrying right there. Um, but. Um, as was indicated by my colleague, uh, you know, there are strong indications that uh, that uh, Wang Jing does have um, at least informal ties. Uh, you know, uh, you know, everyone from Jiang Zemin in, in his time to, uh, to to President Xi has has visited um, his uh, um, his uh, his. Uh, uh, you know, headquarters in, in, in Hong Kong. There's pictures in Weibo, Weibo um, with, uh, with with President Hu. Um, but really, the issue with with the canal, and we're getting to a critical point in in the canal because uh, the um, the route of the canal was recently published. Um, the environmental study from the the Spanish firm that's uh, that, that's doing it will be coming out soon. Um, they've at least indicated that they will be breaking ground um, in um, in or around the the beginning of the year. Um, why do I say that this is this is critical? Um, because up until now, you've been spending at the rate, uh, I think, about $300 million, which supposedly uh, is, is Wang Jing's own money, although some of it may be coming uh, indirectly uh, through Nicaragua itself. Um, but once you actually break ground, once you begin construction, um, and some cynically speculate that they will just begin construction in the plum projects like like the airport and, 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 and the port widening, of which uh, there's a very powerful series of legal rights that HKD has. Um, but if you begin in kind of full bore phase one, you know, moving of earth and things like that, this is when you have to spend real money. And up until now, you can dole out small amounts of money um, on, again, the environmental impact studies and lobbying and, and things like that. But when you really commit to, you know, serious hydraulic work, serious, um, first of all, you have to spend that serious money, it's very difficult to see that because of the lack of transparency, other other concerns about the nature of the concession to HKD, that major institutional Western investors are going to step up to the plate and and fund this thing. And so whatever the political connections, um, it probably is not going to happen without Chinese money. And so when it starts happening, we will probably know if CDB really does have a major stake in the deal, um, if uh, China Railway Road is going to continue being the sole major Chinese player or serious players with appropriate experience like Sino Hydro or China Harbor or CWE will, will start to, to get real pieces, um, whether the Chinese banks will step in. And so in many ways, I think 2015 is going to be a, um, you know, put your cards on the table or postpone them, um, you know, the time for, for the canal. And uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Great. Let's open it up. Um, there are microphones. Please uh, raise your hand, wait for a microphone, and please let us know who you are. Right here. Is this on? It is on. Okay. I'm Barbara Stallings from Brown University. Um, I've got a couple of questions that could be answered by any or all of the panel members. First, I'm interested in whether any of you have any information on relationships between Chinese companies in Latin America and representatives of other multinationals also working in the same place. 
I've been doing some work recently on Chinese and other Asian activities in Southeast Asia, and I've been struck by Koreans, Japanese, Thai, etc., saying, we have no idea what the Chinese are doing. They don't have any interaction with the rest of us. They don't even go to meetings held by the governments of the host countries. So we don't know anything. So I'm curious as to whether they operate in the same way in Latin America or any particular countries in Latin America, because I was impressed by the idea that things proceed in different ways in different countries, especially uh, Ms. Zhang made that point. And second, um, different topic, I'm wondering to what extent the Chinese investments in Latin America have assisted Latin American uh, countries in exporting to China. Now, of course, we know in the natural resource uh, cases that that's the main point is to export copper or iron ore or soy back to China. But what about the um, newer kinds of investments, especially in manufacturing, the Latin American countries in agriculture? Um, the ma Latin American countries are very eager to diversify their exports to China. To what extent have these new investments helped in that process, as they did with earlier Japanese investments in Latin America? Thanks. Some meaty questions there. Uh, let's take another question or two and then come back to the panel. All the way in the back there? Sure. Hi, my name is Brenda Seaver and I'm currently a fellow here at the Wilson Center. And my question to all of the panel concerns um, the relationship between Chinese companies and Venezuela operating in Venezuela, investing in Venezuela. You've spoken um, in detail about the extent to which Chinese companies have learned um, in other countries and countries we see as positive models like Chile. But what have they learned about dealing with basket cases like Venezuela? <laughs> Thank you. Back here. I'm Jeff Lovelace. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Bolivia. I'm curious to know it, what's China doing in Bolivia? Great. All right. Let's turn back to our panelists. Um, maybe, okay, Evan, we'll start with you this time. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful questions. Um, first of all, with respect to Ms. Stalling's questions, um, uh, the Chinese are collaborating with each, with others in some niche cases. For I would mention uh, the case of Montrevar, um, uh, formerly uh, Amimex in, in Colombia, where you had a Chinese and Indian company, uh, ONGC Videsh, who actually collaborated rather than competed in developing an oil property in the Magdaleno Medio region of, of Colombia. Um, a almost unheard of case in Mexico, where you have collaboration between a Chinese and Japanese company, uh, uh, for, uh, enterprise called Tide Minth. Uh, to produce uh, plastic components in the auto sector. Um, although um, these are, by and large, the exceptions, you have cases of, of significant competition between China and, and Russian companies and others in the petroleum sectors in various countries, um, in the, the iron and steel sectors, in, in, in mining, um, etc. Et, et and indeed, uh, although the Chinese uh, are getting better at um, sharing information at the country level, oftentimes through informal networks, um, oftentimes Chinese companies have difficulty talking with each other, let alone with other uh, countries. Um, with respect to um, the question of exports, um, I find two distinct patterns. One is with respect to um, primary product exports and agricultural exports where the investments are generally to obtain a secure source of supply at reasonable prices to China. Um, again, the Las Bombas, um, the recent uh, $7 billion acquisition in Peru, it's estimated that, s that almost a half of all minerals exported from Las Bombas will actually go um, to, to China. Uh, China fisheries, a lot of uh, the fisheries investments also in Peru um, are going actually uh, to, to China. Um, but on the other side, manufacturers, oftentimes um, the, the investment in globally integrated supply chains is oriented in a kind of a triangulation sense to get into third markets. Markets. So, for example, some of the Mexican automotive investments had both Mexico and also eventually the U.S. car market in mind. Um, many of the Brazil and, and Uruguayan investments, uh, for example, Cherry and Montevideo, um, had the Mercosur market in mind. Um, and so, uh, clearly, that part doesn't seem to be exporting back to China. With respect to Venezuela, what are the Chinese companies learning? I, I think um, one of the things where you're seeing a perf perf 
Profundization um, is um, learning how to manage risk. Um, many of, I, I think uh, in 2012, 2013, uh, many of the Chinese, especially after um, just the, the massive push forward by Chen Yuan and China Development Bank, had kind of an aha moment, uh, um, you know, much like is what happened with Libya, where the Chinese had to withdraw from the company, leaving behind many in place assets and petroleum in, in, in other places. Um, this notion of what happens if we actually, um, you know, if the Chavistas actually lose control of the country. Um, I think now the Chinese have gotten better at managing risk. I, I think uh, um, you know combination of funneling everything through the various different Chinese investment funds, where the Chinese companies essentially pay themselves um, and then are repaid in Venezuelan oil, um, relatively short-term loans, typically three-year terms. Um, also, the, the fact that the oil they are pumping out of the ground in Venezuela to repay the loan actually is coming from, for example, Sinovensa, um, MPE, the MPE three block. Basically, they are controlling, um, despite the fact that it's nominally in Petavesa's hands, the oil that's actually being used to pay the loan going into the, the, the China Bank uh, accounts. With respect to Bolivia, this is a fascinating case, wonderful question, um, where um, it, uh, that relationship it, it stalled for a number of years. Um, it had some promising indication, promising possibilities in 2007, 2008, but with the um, essentially the the secession crisis, um, with the the Media Luna uh, departments in in Bolivia and and the whole constitutional process, um, those Chinese investments were put on hold. Uh, nominal cooperation between some of the Chinese oil majors and and, and YPFB, but um, only more recently are you starting to see some major projects go forward. A, a 600 million dollar highway project was actually uh, just finalized in in. in that President Morales uh, had with uh, with uh, um, with the senior Chinese official, um, I believe uh, in New York, as, as I recall, uh, you have uh, the possibility of a four billion dollar major hydroelectric project, uh, Rositas, uh, going forward by the Chinese company who actually did the feasibility study for free on the project. Um, you have new cooperation with YPFB. Um, you actually have a, a new major deal where, uh, after having kicked out the Indian company Jindal um, from uh, El Mutun and, and Santa Cruz, uh, you now have. Uh, the Chinese uh, uh, committing to a uh, $400 million loan to help the Bolivians build a steel plant to <coughs> industrialize what the Bolivian government is basically going to do on their own, which is, is developing uh, El Mutun. So I think as you have progressive stability with the upcoming uh, Bolivian elections, um, an indication that uh, Morales and the MAS are not going to collapse anytime soon, I think the Chinese are starting to move forward in Bolivia, um, as you've seen them move forward in, in Ecuador and Venezuela and, and elsewhere. And of course, uh, you know, I have to mention the, the satellite deals, the successful launch of Bolivia's first satellite, and basically the complete dominance now of not only the space, but also Bolivia's telecom sector, and the fact that you have this entire professional cadre of Bolivian space and telecommunication professionals, all of which who have been trained in, in, in China. And now with the second Bolivian satellite, the Bertolina Sisa, which will, um, I think we're, we're going to get into Tupac uh, Amaru's cousins next for future satellites. But, uh, um, but, but clearly there is a strong relationship in Bolivia. Um, I think Chinese companies um, are running in kind of a very low-key um, fashion in Latin American countries. Um, the company that I, the mining company that I visited um, in Chile, they have an office um, in San Diego in a building and they don't even have a sign on their door. So if you go there by yourself, you won't know that's an office of their company. Um, and when I was talking with them, they're kind of working in a very closed way. Um, most of the staff was um, stay in the office and they use instant messages to um, communicate with the people um, from their from the headquarters in for example Beijing um, I I don't know for sure but I doubt they have interactions with um, representatives of um, multinational companies but they do have close interactions with the Chinese embassies there and also the um, trade promotion agencies um, in that country, for, for example, CIE or ProChile. Um, about the Chinese assistance in exporting to China, um, for one thing is the, the ministries is trying to speed up the approval um, um, process for um, Latin American countries. For example, I think this year they have approved um, Costa Rica to export pineapples to China. Um, and they're trying to expand the category list for um, the countries to export their products. But the, another thing is um, 
now I see that the, for example, the Latin American countries are cooperating with the Chinese agencies, but also they are um, cooperating with the private companies. For example, um, Chile has a campaign on Taobao, on um, its uh, e-commerce um, website in China, which is, which is very popular. That is um, cooperated by the Chilean um, embassy in Beijing and also the Taobao, the company, and also um, the Chinese agencies to promote Chilean um, products. And we can see that, for example, um, I think most of the blueberries that we can see in Chinese markets are now from Chile. And they have exported a huge amount of red wine to China. And um, especially when, you know, the anti-corruption campaign, I think they sell even better than the old world wines. Um, I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, well, um, I think in addition to um, diversify investment portfolio in Latin country and also export uh, um, some products to China, like agricultural premium agricultural products. I think one of the key motivation for trans company to set their foot in on the ground is that uh, they can use the uh, uh, local con uh, countries as a gateway to the uh, hinterland market or Latin American countries. So they just not uh, the export products to China, but they want to sell, expanding their um, sales channels and uh, to serve the, uh, this huge market, 600 million people. So I think um, um, they're trying to uh, um, build up kind of foothold in Latin countries and use kind of FTA uh, agreement um, between a Latin country, um, Latin, Latin American country and the US and the Can Canada. So use these the um, opportunities as a springboard to jump into the uh, uh, advanced economies markets. So this is one of the strategy uh, they're trying to uh, uh, practice in, uh, locally. So uh, about the uh, uh, Chinese uh, footprint um, in, in, in Venezuela, I think it has more to do with the political construction, uh, political consideration. So um, uh, especially why I, I know quite of my, my friends in ex, uh, Export and Import Bank of China. So they have <coughs> very big office in, in Caracas. And uh, um, each year they send uh, um, a group of um, uh, staff members to, to, to Venezuela to do in bus uh, to business. So what I heard is that uh, they, they are trying to, because the political motivation, so uh, they are increasing their presence and uh, they are increasing their uh, um, uh, um, business there. So I think it has, has more to do with the um, political consideration. It's, you know, it's more than the uh, business consideration. And uh, uh, I'm not familiar with Bolivia, uh, Bo Bolivian um, trans business in there, but I think it's another case of the, uh, so if you just roughly speaking, you have the uh, uh, Chile, Costa Rica, Colombia on the right side of the, uh, the uh, political spectrum. You have the uh, um, um, uh, Venezuela, uh, uh, Bolivia, uh, Bolivia, Cuba on the left side of the political spectrum, and uh, you have the, some center left, center right uh, countries. So. Um, talking about Chinese the um, uh, footprint in this the uh, left side of um, countries, I would argue that um, um, it has more to do with the uh, political consideration. Yes, I don't know. Uh, I don't think uh, you know the uh, Chinese com uh, Chinese government has the ambition to set a foot in the backyard of the American United States. Uh, I, I don't think they are that in naive to thinking of this, right? But. Uh, uh, we're trying to uh, create kind of a political link and a commercial link between uh, China companies and uh, their companies, the Chinese government and their com governments. We're trying to uh, be uh, um, uh, show our presence um, in Latin, com Latin American countries. But uh, uh, um, I, I, yes, I, I don't think they, they are naive to see uh, we can uh, um, um, go at expense of uh, U.S. U.S. interest. But anyway, we are trying to do set of our foothold. Here and uh, um, doing, trying to, uh, act, for example, um, import some um, oil and uh, gas from from Venezuela, and uh, doing to try uh, create a kind of uh, business opportunities for trans company in these uh, emerging, you know, economies. I think it's in line with a Chinese um, um, diplomatic initiative initiative that we must uh, um, cultivate ties not just political ties, but also commercial ties with emerging economies. Yeah. 
More questions. I see two hands here. First, yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Huang Shan and Yuan An, for your splendid uh, presentation today. And I'm quite, uh, I'm quite curious about it. Uh, what's the Chinese public's perspective, uh, their, their perspective about the Chinese uh, strengthening uh, appearance in the Latin American countries? Because nowadays we are aware that the more and more Chinese grassroots uh, people are more uh, are interested in di discussing, even debating the Chinese foreign policy, especially on the internet. And some will criticize that. Um, before, uh, before the government uh, spent uh, that much of money, resource, and energy to build in the ties with develop other developing countries, maybe the government should better uh, had better to, to tackle the serious problems at home first. And uh, with this kind of opinion uh, uh, backfired, the, the the Chinese strengthening uh, development pace in, in the Latin American countries. And other hand, uh, on the other hand, is Chinese government concerning about to? Uh, uh, explaining the China's grand strategy in Latin America or to providing some panoramic pictures uh, to the Chinese public, just as, just as what you have done today for us. Yeah, that's my question. Could you remind us who you are? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm Xu from uh, University of, uh, University of uh, Edinburgh. Yeah. Thank you. Back here. Hi, I'm uh, Tyler Gibson from the Blue Moon Fund. Um, in terms of China's environmental impact, um, you guys talked a lot about the mining impacts. Um, so I was wondering if you guys could speak a little more to uh, China's footprint in the Amazon region, um, particularly because 70% of Chinese investment is in the Amazon basin, and China is one of the largest consumers of both uh, soy and palm oil in the world, and those are huge drivers of deforestation. Um, and also, as far as I'm aware, and I may, may be outdated on this, but uh, Chinese companies, Chinese oil companies, are the only two oil companies that have bought blocks in Yasuni in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. um, so that's also a big concern. And then could you guys also speak to the recent rolling back of uh, environmental regulations in Peru and the impact that that's going to have? Thank you. Sure. Um, all the way in the back, Tom. Thank you. Uh, Tom O'Keefe from the Foreign Service Institute. Um, I wonder if any of you could please comment about um, the recent uh, news that's coming out of Argentina about uh, trying to seek a strategic, a new strategic relationship uh, with other emerging powers in the world. In particular, uh, the focus is on China and Russia. Uh, there was announcement of yet another uh, currency swap agreement with Argentina. Uh, there's also lots of talk about uh, uh, Chinese state oil companies uh, being involved in uh, developing um, shale, oil, and gas reserves in the far south of the country as well. Thank you. Okay, and perhaps one more. Uh, let's go down here in front. Hello, my name is Steve Lannon. I uh, studied this topic in graduate school. And uh, just interested in to hear uh, some comments about the concerns of uh, intelligence or national security regarding the uh, relationships. I mean, I, I've heard a lot about the, uh, the political and economic and the uh, uh, business development, which is always very positive for, for all involved. But what are some of the concerns, whether uh, realized or uh, maybe overblown, that, uh, that might uh, you could comment on about uh, uh, intelligence gathering in the region and uh, security implications for all countries in the U.S. In included? Okay, who would like to begin? Okay. Um, Go ahead. <clears throat> I, I'll address Mr. Xu's question about the um, perception of Chinese public of um, China's foreign policy in Latin America. Um, I think um, generally it's, um, in, term, in terms of the um, media coverage that I saw, um, I think um, the perception about Chinese um, companies going to um, Latin America is relatively positive because compared with other, for example, with ASEAN, with the Southeast Asia, we have the territory disputes sometimes would um, influence the investment relationship, trade and investment relationships. And Africa is more criti um, criticized more often in <coughs> both in China and in other countries. Um, I don't think it's a tradition for the Chinese gov government to um, explicitly to say what is our grand strategy um, in different regions, 
But I, I, I think um, the China and the Latin America um, relationship falls into the bigger um, category of the um, relationship with devel developing countries, emerging countries, and South and South cooperation. Um, in terms of this one, um, I think most of the Chinese publics would support um, China seeking an, a bigger role in the world stage. Um, and it's practical to cooperate with um, some countries with um, similar needs or demands or um, complementary um, demands. So um, from my point of view, I think, um, and also when I see on um, social media when um, President Xi Jinping visited um, Latin American countries um, twice, I. I didn't see many t um, too negative comments, for, for example, on Weibo or WeChat. So um, my impression is generally it's positive. Thank you. Sean? Um, yes, um, I think if you look at uh, uh, Chinese presidency's um, overseas trip, you will see it's quite clear that the uh, current administration's diplomatic focus is on emerging economies and uh, developing countries. So he just paid a visit to European ones and uh, just have a very n informal uh, meeting with President Obama in Sunnyvale, California. And other than that, he didn't visit any uh, advanced economies. So I think it's quite clear that uh, we Chinese government pay a lot of attention and put a lot of resources into um, emerging economies and uh, developing countries. So one case is that if you notice that uh, just um, two or three years ago, China sent its vice foreign minister to as the current uh, you know, Brazil ambassador to Brazil. So uh, in previous time, we just have a se uh, ambassador to seven countries and international organizations. They are vice minister 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 level level officials. So now our current ambassador to Brazil is a uh, vice minister. So that means Chinese put a lot of premium on the importance of uh, emerging economies. And also you look at uh, the latest appointment of a Chinese ambassador to India. It's also from uh, his uh, assistant uh, foreign minister and he's a rising star within the uh, diplomat uh, diplomat ranks. So I think this represents uh, Chinese the, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, the trend. It's, it's the trend that uh, we put uh, more resources and you know human resources and the physical resources into the developing commercial and political ties with eco emerging economies. People just put this in the context <coughs> of the so-called um, new West East. You know, confrontation or squabble or things like that, because everybody noticed that the new NDB, new development bank, uh, BRICS banks, and also Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, is serve as kind of the uh, um, uh, uh, replacement of the World Bank and IMF. Yes, I think it's uh, still in the early stage, and everybody talking about the uh, you know uh, we you have pros and cons about the uh, these kind of new institutions. But anyway, we have the, the uh, very early stage of this kind of development of the so-called West East um, uh, um, um, confrontation. So, I I, I don't think Chinese government uh, um, is willing to ch you know challenge the current world order or have a capacity to do this now. But we're trying to uh, show that we we are willing to do this if the Western world um, doesn't, you know, um, change, adjust its current playbook. That means, yes, we are willing to play by, by the rule book, but it's not the book, you know, which has been already written by the Western powers since the end of World War II. We're trying to have some new ad, new elements. So I think the, the, the dominant sentiment within Beijing, when, especially when it comes to the financial services, uh, financial, international financial institutions reforms that, uh, you know, in 2010, uh, IMF, you know, has agreed to increase in the Chinese voting share and quota in IMF, but now we didn't see, you know, it's, it's proceeding. And uh, now four years has pa ha have passed, so I think they they they, they are quite disappointed with the uh, slow and piecemeal progress uh, which has been made um, over the past few.
few years. So um, out of this concern, and also I, I, I mentioned before that uh, um, it's on the one hand, it's the rapid decline of Western power in terms of financial and political influence. And also we, we, we have seen that uh, US, you know, the European countries are becoming increasingly mired in, in, in for example, in, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Ukraine, and all these issues, I think, um, is a, I think now the, the dominant perception in Beijing is that uh, um, you guys um, um, cannot have allocate, you know, enough sufficient resources to, to, um, to new areas, to these, you know, emerging economies, you were buckled down in this mire for quite a while. Quite a while. So now it is time for us to, to to grab this moment to 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 pose kind of challenge to current stand, uh, current um, world order. So I think this is the prevailing sentiment, and it's gaining momentum from a lot of policymakers within Beijing, not just from the economic but also the political um, terms. Um, um, so um, um, I would argue that uh, um, we will see more um, more more confrontation um, approach um, um, in years ahead. And uh, talking about the mining impact, uh, I'm not uh, actually. Unfortunately, I I was uh, not able to visit Latin America until now. But uh, from my experience in in Africa, in 2008, I visited Zambia, and at that time, Zambia was you know in a uh, there's a lot of uh, we call the uh, um, um, local people's riots and protests against the Chinese Chinese miners, <coughs> Chinese owners there, and even they burn, they set fire to a you know the factory. But uh, I but at that time we visit a Chinese company. It's it's the op a company factory operated by China non ferrous uh, uh, mining uh, corporation. And it's one of the signature projects in locally, and the local people are quite welcome, you know, Chinese investment because a lot of uh, uh, mining assets Chinese company acquire there are left by their Western peers. That means these these mines are, you know, is shortage of 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 minerals contents, and uh, they just uh, scrap a uh, deserted. You know, Western companies just deserted um, these these mines. So when Chinese come came, so they re try to recycle and use their technology and the cheap labor to uh, revitalize these already deserted mines. So they create job opportunities for local people. So a lot of African, um, um, you know, um, um, people they came to me, they came to us, say, well, actually, we well welcome Chinese companies because they you re created a job opportunity for us. And also we visited some uh, waste water and the waste um, uh, management facilities. So I was quite impressed by the, uh, the, the uh, up-to-date uh, up to date, um, of technology they introduced. So they say they, they, they will uh, not discharge any drop of uh, waste water into the, uh, uh, um, into the local environment. So they have put in place the most advanced technology to to uh, recycle the wastewater. So all of these things, um, uh, I think it's taking place um, uh, be, uh, 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 in front of my eyes. So I, I would argue that, that um, yes, we, we, we did a lot of, uh, um, you know, we, we impact the local environment and uh, sometimes we pollute the local environment. But uh, if, if, I think if you can Trying to be a sustainable, sustain your operation locally, and trying to be a sustainable partner locally, I think you need to uh, be in line with the uh, local regulation and trying to uh, 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 be a uh, you know take the, the social responsibility for your business here. Um, a couple quick points. Uh, first of all, with respect to uh, the impact on the Amazon, um, I, I would concur that uh, the uh, impact of, of Chinese engagement uh, commercially in Latin America on the Amazon is enormous and, and uh, across the board. But as a caveat, uh, it is not necessarily because Chinese companies are behaving 
worse than their non-Chinese counterparts, uh, s simply because of the nature of, 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 of what's happening. And, and again, it's across the board. Um, with respect to, of course, hydroelectric projects, um, you have the, the role of state grid that actually is, is a producer of, of uh, some of the transmission lines and generators um, in the Belo Monte uh, Dam, um, which, of course, has a, a vast impact on, on the area that will be you know, flooded and developed. Um, as you pointed out, uh, you have the movement of the soy frontier towards the west um, as more and more soy land is, is developed largely for export to, to China as well as to, to India and other destinations. Um, and again, I, I think uh, actually just this year, uh, Brazil became the largest of uh, uh, China's uh, sources of, uh, of soy. And, and again, uh, you know, that impact is, is vast on the interior. Um, but in addition, uh, as uh, Latin American uh, countries uh, try to connect the Atlantic and the Pacific, something often considered a, a good thing, um, the revival of many of the infrastructure road programs contemplated under the IRSA program. And of course, uh, recently we heard about uh, new railway projects and, and um, you know, different uh, transoceanic, uh, you know, dry canals as well as the Nicaragua Canal. Um, but for example, you look at the Amazon, the uh, the uh, what's called the bioceanic route, so the first to be completed, the uh, bioceanic sur, um, going from the south of Peru in, into Brazil, trying to connect up near near the heartland in, in Manaus. Um, the um, what has happened, though, is is as those roads cut through previously isolated areas, Madre de Dios in Peru, um, and, and then, of course, the Brazilian Amazon as, as you move east, that then opens up areas to loggers, to um, you know, criminal activities, to just development in ways that it previously was not opened up, and that has indirect uh, impacts. Um, in addition, of course, you mentioned the oil sector, of course, uh, in the um, – in the um, call it the, the Western Amazon, for example, we we can talk about. You mentioned uh, Yasuni. Um, you have uh, you know a number of different oil projects, and of course, uh, you know China now involved in possibly four of, of the major uh, five major oil projects uh, going on in, in, in Peru as, as, as well. But in the case of Yasuni, you had kind of a quid pro quo where for a number of years the Chinese. I, I remember in 2007 being in Ecuador talking about uh, um, these issues. That okay, um, you know. Yeah, the Chinese will agree to fund the uh, El Aroma refinery, the refinery of the Pacific, when and if Korea opens up uh, the ITT fields, uh, Yasuni. Um, and now, even though the Chinese companies have concessions just at the edge of Yasuni, it's it's pretty clear that basically the, the Ecuadorian crude that would come from there is going to be in part what will feed the now Chinese CNPC-operated um, refinery of the Pacific that, that's going forward. So there, there clearly are, are environmental impacts um, without implicating Chinese per se. With respect to Argentina, um, I think that's a difficult, uh, it's, it's a complex case. I often uh, jokingly say that Argentina is perhaps the, the only one of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, you know, counter Western um, countries in, in Latin America that have treated the Chinese as badly as they've treated the West. Um, so it's uh, um, so what you find, of course, with with the diplomacy uh, in uh, when uh, Vladimir Putin uh, came to Argentina, um, you had to uh, talk about uh, possibly building the fifth and sixth uh, of the nuclear reactors that they want to go forward with. Although uh, China was actually awarded the the third Atucha three, I'm sorry, the, the fourth, which is Atucha three. Um, there's a there's an additional one uh, elsewhere in the country, but um, so so I think you clearly do see Argentina's attempt to look for strategic um, players. Uh, China's given uh, Argentina kind of a, um, well, we support you on the issue of the vulture funds, but um, if you don't cut a good deal that makes the IMF happy, um, we're not going to go forward with the $7 billion in you know funding for Belgrano Cargas and, and the two hydroelectric projects. And so um, China's clearly straddled the fence on Argentina, and so I think that pushes Argentina to basically diversify its options. Um, I mean, there's been times when uh, Argentina has uh, haltingly pursued relationships uh, with, with Iran, uh, certainly uh, um, an attempt on, under the previous uh, Iranian, uh, um, uh, um, the Iranian uh, president. Uh, however, currently with uh, President Rouhani, um, you've seen, I think, a bit more hesitation for Iranian engagement. Uh, clearly, there is an interest on the part of, of Japan and, and, and India, um, but they're less willing to essentially break with Western economic and, and legal standards to engage with Argentina. So, so I think it really comes to a kind of China-Russia play that the Argentine the Argentines are, are looking to pursue. Um, and, and then finally, with respect to the impacts, uh, the national security impacts, and uh, um, this is where I put on my, uh, my, uh, my, my, my hawkish uh, you know, DOD representative hat without meaning to scare anyone. But um, I, I think there are vast impacts on both the security of the region and the security implications for the United States, but without impact. Impl impl without implying that there is a nefarious Chinese plan. I think the Chinese are as worried that the United States has secret designs to block Chinese 
China's rise as you know the United States is convinced. And yet, responsible people in all defense establishments and security establishments have to plan for what might happen if one had to confront the other big kid on the block. And you know, frankly, right now, um, you know, that's probably China. Um, but. In terms of the impacts itself, um, of course, you have indirect sustainment of regimes such as the Alba regimes through massive loan you know, programs, which then sustains both the risk of collapse and the types of activities that Alba is doing throughout the region. Um, you have um, the impacts on trans-Pacific organized crime. We're seeing uh, flows of, of cocaine, contraband goods, illegal mining. Again, it's not the Chinese state fault, but this is an increasingly difficult phenomenon. Um, try to count the number of, of people in Latin American police forces who have close contacts with um, you know, Chinese provinces like Fuxian or, or the ability to decipher uh, or understand what the people who are now talking in Cantonese and Hakka that they've just brought into the police station are actually saying. So there's real issues there. Um, clearly, China as an alternative, both in the Alba states and others, undermine the impact of, of uh, our esteemed colleagues at, at state Roberta Jacobson and others to to push the U.S. agenda of a certain model of democracy and human rights. Um, you know, if you can get the money from China, why do you have to wait seven years to get the money from the IMF, et cetera? Um, including the United States' ability to try to get collaborative partnerships elsewhere in the world. Uh, clearly, this becomes an issue now in looking places like the Ukraine. Um, you know, uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, the Russians being um, frustrated with the Europeans. I don't. We'll turn and we'll, we'll, we'll buy more food from, uh, from Argentina and, and Brazil. What happens in Latin America does impact U.S. engagement strategically globally. Um, the issue of governability, if Venezuela um, you know, erupts into civil war or, or other types of, uh, of chaos, um, or if you have other types of governability issues, uh, basically ungoverned spaces where um, transnational criminal organizations or terrorist organizations or whatever can cooperate in the region, um, because of the proliferation of, of the type of governance issues that we see in ALBA regimes, that indirectly impacts U.S. security. Um, and, and frankly, there are certain, uh, there are certain uh, um, concerns that, uh, you know, if the United States, and, and I, you know, say this in the dearest professional terms for my Chinese colleague, but, uh, you know, hey, you always have to say something interesting at one of these, uh, these, these get-togethers. Um, if in the undesirable and unlikely event that the United States and China, um, you know, end up in, in, in a conflict, and that's something I sincerely hope, you know, never happens, um, one has to imagine that um, the things that um, Chinese companies having basically rewired the telecom structure, put up, you know, the, all the space assets, um, having been in a position where, you know, Chinese companies such as Costco and China Shipping and China Harbor and, you know, pretty much have a, a pretty good map of the Latin American American port infrastructure and the sustainability, having worked relatively closely with Latin American militaries never ever more closely. Um, you know, the fact that China does not have bases or exclusive agreements on the Soviet model um, is not necessarily a long-term comfort. Um, the Chinese commercial presence gives the China Chinese a pretty wide range of options, um, and it's difficult for me to imagine that if we ever got into a bad situation with our with our with our our our, 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 our Chinese colleagues whether it was over Taiwan or South China Sea or whatever um, hard to imagine that the Chinese would not also seek to exploit all of the capabilities that they have um, in other parts of the world um, you know to to make that more difficult for the United States to engage in in, in Asia and so what is happening I, I do think does play into the broader strategic picture and that's something that um, you know, U.S. Uh, national security people, uh, you know, have to take into consideration. Um, you know, Latin America isn't just the, you know, unpleasant land of, of uh, you know, drugs and the occasional, uh, you know, terrorists and, and, and modern street gangs. Um, uh, Latin America does play as part, as a fundamental part of, of what's happening with the U.S. ability to engage globally in a, in a broader fashion. Great. We'll take one more round. Um, I see back here and then two in the front. One in the back. Okay, four more questions. Kent Hughes, I'm here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Thank you for a terrific panel. Uh, Dr. Arntzen opened her remarks by noting that the pluses for commodity exporters had often been offset by some negative impact on manufacturers, and she mentioned the $18 billion trade deficit in Mexico. Uh, there, to some extent, these current account and trade imbalances have been linked to undervalued currencies. And China is often singled out as having a particularly active, undervalued currency. Have Chinese companies or China run into that kind of concern in investing in Latin America? 
Let's see. Uh, I had two down here. Why don't we start on this side? We'll just go across and then and then back. And while we're passing the microphone, I'd like to introduce Christine Zeno, who seems to want to escape, a uh, program associate with the Latin American program, who was instrumental in putting this together. Thank, as always, our dedicated interns for uh, their help with all of the logistics. So um, please. Thank you. My name is Hong Zhang. I'm a colleague of Huangshan in Yunnan. And so uh, my question is to Mr. Ellis. Um, I wonder if we could address a little, a little bit more about the role of the U.S. government, taking the U.S. government to this equation, because we're seeing on the one hand the closer uh, economic ties between China and Latin America, and on the other hand, uh, the damaged relationship between U.S. and Latin America due to, uh, I know, the re revelation. So what, 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 how concerned do you think the U.S. government is about growing political influence of China in this region, the tradi traditionally considered as a backyard? And, and so when you compare that, the China's p pivot to Latin America <coughs> with U.S. pivot to Asia, what are the commonalities you found? What are the similarities you, you find in these two cases? Thank you. Here. Thank you very much. My name is Abby Chin. I am a student at the University of Texas at Dallas, and I have a question, a follow-up question to Ms. Strong's response to Ms. Stalin's question earlier. Uh, Ms. Strong, you mentioned that the, from your observa observation, uh, Chinese companies in Latin America tend to operate in very low-key fashion, and then they may lack interactions with other multinationals. So I'm just wondering if this business practice seems to be a general Chinese business practice that goes over broad, uh, that they tend to be acting as loners, or is this just part of the learning curve in Latin America and that these companies will be opening up? Okay, and finally in the back, Rodrigo. Thank you, Rodrigo Valderrama, Plantation International. I thought when you were talking about, you know, all this drugs going on and these uh, unpleasant gangs. I thought maybe you were talking about New York or Los Angeles, but anyway. So <laughs> um, my question about the media um, I in Latin America, actually, is there cooperation and how, how are you working um, and other entities, public and private, from China uh, with the media in Latin America on coverage about business ties and, and those things? Also, um, can you give us a, a little... Um, synopsis about the Shanghai uh, free trade zone and how that's going to shape the future of commerce in Latin America and other places too. Sure. Okay, why don't we start with Evan and we'll just come back this way. Okay, great. Um, first of all, uh, with respect to uh, the, the currency situation, um, and, and of course, as you're aware, uh, the currency actually, uh, you know, has been allowed to correct to, to, to some degree. But uh, there is probably two dimensions to that. Um, one is that uh, you know certain dollarized economies, uh, you know, Ecuador comes to, comes to mind. Um, their own competitiveness uh, before China's hurt. Um, uh, other currencies which are tied indirectly to the dollar, such as um, you know, such, uh, such as the real in, in Brazil. Um, also, uh, you know, the, Braz the Brazilians like to, to, to complain that. One of the reasons that their manufacturing is is so uncompetitive is is because, um, you know, their currency has been pushed up, um, you know, by its relationship to the dollar. I think there's other reasons why Brazil is uncompetitive, but I won't go there. Um, the uh, with respect to, but but I think there's a, there's a broader sense that uh, um, as China engages in Latin America, you're seeing a ever greater attempt to do um, direct uh, deals to get away from a, a dollar-denominated economy and or a de dollar-denominated world economy and to inject the yuan, the renminbi, um, as part of the basket of, of international reserve currencies. And so I think if you look across the board, the original 2009 $10 billion currency swap with Argentina, the most recent $11 billion one, um, the $30 billion uh, currency uh, swap agreement with Brazilian banks, um, the attempts to, to set up commodity agreements so there's a direct commodity trade um, um, without going through, uh, you know, dollars. Um Deals such as Ecuador and Venezuela, the, um, the 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 loan deals, which again are, are oftentimes partially, if not wholly, denominated um, in renminbi, and so I think you have an attempt to use the international um, the the commerce to to actually inject more fully the renminbi. Um, into the world system through the region, as, as well as just a question of, of the direct impact of the dollar. Um, but now with respect to the second question, uh, how concerned is the U.S. government? Um, I mean, I, c I can tell you that, that 
you know, this is certainly something that is on people's radar screens and has been on people's radar screens for at least, uh, you know, 11 years that I've followed this. Um, you know, I, I know that, uh, you know, this is, you know, something that, you know, certainly comes up with, uh, you know, people such as Roberta Jacobson at State or, or uh, people such as Dr. Chavez on, on, on the DOD side, uh, you know, with respect to important uh, Latin American issues. Um, now, should people be more concerned, um, you know, does the U.S. have a secret plan? You know, I think, I, I think frankly, we're in a moment, um, as my, my colleague put it well, where the United States has a lot on our plate. Um, and, you know, just when you thought that we were getting ready to pivot to China, um, you know, then, you know, along comes Syria, and then along comes Ukraine, and along comes, you know, a thousand other things. And, and so um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a challenge to get to the latest important strategic issue, but over the long term, Latin America is intimately connected to U.S. national security. We are geographically connected. What happens in the region, you know, comes to our borders literally. Um, to the extent we can see Cuba, Mexico, other things, um, Latin America is not a, just a foreign policy issue for us. It is a domestic issue for us, and we see that every day. Latin America, you know, the majority of U.S. imports and exports come through Latin America. What happens in the region impacts our investments, impacts our trade, impacts the prosperity of Americans. Um, Latin America is an issue of family. Um, you look at the vast proportion of people in the United States who come from Latin America, who have family in Latin America. Um, there is no other region in the world in which what happens there so intimately affects us politically, geographically, economically, and in terms of, of family. So um, I think we'll see this becoming a greater concern in, 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 in coming years. Um, and also we may see that depending on what happens politically in Washington and that with the next presidency, et cetera, that uh, um, you, you may see a, a shift in, in what regions of, of the world are focused on. Um, and so the, the way that Washington responds to this issue may not continue the same depending on on what happens in the future um, about Chinese companies um, working in a um, low-key fashion I think it's part of the learning curve um, because um, the external actors like the um, South Korea and Japan um, will be competing in certain areas like infrastructure and mining um, and China need to know what they are thinking about. Of course, they will be interested in knowing what China is thinking about. Um, and about the presence of China in Latin America, I think it's still limited. For example, in San Diego, I can I can see some of Chinese restaurants or grocery stores um, on the street, but not a single time I was greeted in Chinese. People see me, they will say konnichiwa, they will say Japanese to me. Mm. Really, mm. S mm. at least three times, um, no matter I was walking on the street or I walk into a store. So I think um, Japan has a, a longer history um, presence and stronger presence in Latin America. So I think um, for China, it's part of the learning curve. They will and they should um, to be um, engaged more with um, multinational companies in the region. Um, about the cooperation with Latin American uh, media, I think it's um, it's really really limited. Um, I I met with some correspondents from Latin American media. Usually, they will have only one or two people um, in Beijing. Um, usually, they will only have in Beijing. Some don't have in Shanghai or other cities. Um, and I think one of Actually, from our um, media, we have um, many cooperation relationships with Western media, like Wall Street Journal or um, which one? Uh, the Guardian. Oh, the, yeah, the Guardian. Yes, we have many like content swap um, um, agreements with many media, and also like Nikkei in Japanese. Um, one of the problem is um, we. I think the generally Chinese media lack um, talents who can speak Spanish. Um, that we can translate the content. And for the Latin American media, very few of them speak Chinese. So it makes it difficult to um, have a cooperation. Like Japanese, they are doing very well um, in, in launching their Chinese website. So it's easy for us to do the um, content swap. Um, I met one um, 
journalist who did the written interview with um, President Xi um, on the first trip, and uh, he expressed that um, Latin American media really need to put more efforts into China, um, and he has made several trips um, to China after that. So I think um, it's one of the areas that we should strengthen to get the information flow. Thank you. Yeah, so just talking about the uh, um, Latin American media um, outlets the footprint in China, I think they just have the minimum visibility. So I, I will uh, echo um, Yuan's uh, comments that I know it's just one Brazil, just give you a case, the, the, the Brazil, the biggest uh, company, uh, country in Latin America. So they just one correspondent in Beijing, and I know this guy quite well, and uh, when he gone, they just have a, a, not, a, a new replacement uh, after you know, uh, many months, the new replacement. And uh, this guy can just speak uh, 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 Spanish and, uh, and some English, but not that fluent in Chinese language. So I think limited their capacity to report China. So I think um, uh, this is uh, um, the area that I think uh, the media organizations in, Lat in Latin American countries need to step up their efforts to, uh, to have more uh, China exposure. And uh, talking about uh, uh, Chinese currencies, the, uh, um, the, I think uh, if you look at uh, uh, nine years ago, since the 2005, I think uh, with the, uh, uh, the, the round of uh, Chinese uh, uh, exchange rate reform, you have seen the, um, uh, actually the Chinese currency, the renminbi, uh, is on the rise and it's appreciating against the um, especially a basket of currencies, particularly U.S. dollars. So I think it's if you look at uh, the background of uh, for ch of in which Chinese company go abroad, that means the with the appreciation of the Chinese currency, uh, Chinese currency. So we have more just purchasing power because of most of the uh, uh, commodities and uh, and uh, the assets will be denominated in U.S. dollars. So. No, I, I think the general trend is that the trans currency is on the rise. So I think uh, it's, it's trans state policy is to encourage um, trans company to to acquire and merge uh, with the um, um, uh, um, foreign companies and uh, foreign assets. So, um, so I think um, talking about Chinese the uh, huge uh, foreign exchange reserve. I think this is not. Uh, um, <coughs> It's 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 not intentional, right? According to a Chinese um, uh, uh, policy statement, we are not intentional to pursuing such large uh, trade uh, surplus with other countries. But uh, um, that's why we're trying to uh, push ahead with their um, uh, investment drive, trying to uh, uh, rebalancing, you know, the, the trade uh, um, and the uh, relationship between between countries. So um, I would argue that uh, uh, um, because the general trend is is uh, is that the Chinese currency is on the rise, so we will see more and more mergers and acquisitions in the years to come, and uh, and uh, we will see a kind of a shrinking trade deficits between, you know, major. You know, for example, a lot of Latin, Latin American countries, commodity producers, and China. Yeah. I will stop here. Great. Mr. Huang, Ms. Zhang, Dr. Ellis, thank you for fascinating presentations, for expanding our understanding and our perspectives on, on this very complicated phenomenon. Thanks for sharing things that demonstrate the breadth of your knowledge of this relationship. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Great. Thank great. you very much. Really good. Okay.